Call all hands. Beat to quarters. Run out the guns. Stand by the starboard battery. One broadside into it, if you please, Captain Bush. Pointers on target. Lynn's stops ready. Aye, aye, sir. Ready. Fire. <laughs> Presenting Michael Redgrave as C.S. Forrester's Indomitable Man of the Sea, Horatio Hornblower. sit at my ease now and look back down the years and smile at the foolish hopes and fears of the man that I was. But my fears were well enough founded then. The Navy and the public were hard masters. And there was no gainsaying the fact that I had surrendered and lost my ship, the Sutherland, at Rosas. The odds had been overwhelming. I had fought to the last, and I was acting under the orders of Admiral Layton, but I had struck my colors. And that was an act which my lords of the Admiralty at Whitehall would find it hard to forgive. I sat solitary in my small cabin on the Victory and listened grimly to the sounds as the captains and admirals who were to try me in assembled. Oh, and still they come. Oh, does it need the whole British Navy to try one captain? Try, like vultures flocking to a feast. Captain Calendar? Yes, my lord. Is the court ready? Aye, my lord. There is only Captain Hornblower's sword to place on the table. Oh. Ah, here it comes now. Thank you. Hmm. A fine sword, Captain Calendar. Yes, my lord. It's a sword of 100 guineas value. It was presented to Captain Hornblower by the Patriotic Fund for his victory over the Spanish ship Natividad. A wonderful achievement, that, my lord. Mm. Yes. Pity it should come to this. I always regarded Hornblower as a very fine officer. Yes, my lord. I still do. That is a very improper remark to make to the president of the court, Captain Callender. <clears throat> I have no feelings about Captain Hornblower. It is my duty to pronounce judgment according to the evidence. Of course, my lord. Shall I place the sword here? Yes, on that table. May go towards me... The uh, point towards where Hornblower will stand. Thank you. Let the court assemble and the gun be fired. Aye, my lord. And, uh, Calendar, as we are alone, I am going to make an improper remark. Indeed, my lord. Yes, if the uh, evidence today is such that I am able to instruct you to turn that sword with the hilt facing Hornblower, I shall be the happiest man in the Navy. Thank you, my lord. With due respect, my lord, I venture to disagree. Next to Hornblower, I shall be the happiest. It's curious that despite the fact that the next hour or two were among the most important of my life, I can recall very little detail. A few impressions remain vivid. The glitter of gold lace on the coats of the semicircle of officers in the great cabin of the victory. The endless formalities of the preliminaries... Uh, the face of the admiralty officer who had been sent to conduct my defense. My sword lying forlornly on the table with its point winking at me with a cold glint. As witness followed witness, I found myself wishing that I'd suffered death in the battle rather than face this weary sifting of pointless information. Uh, one moment, please, Captain Bush. 
Now, on this matter of judgment, where was your place during the battle? On the quarterdeck, beside the captain, sir, uh, to receive his orders. So that everything that was visible to him was apparent to you also? Yes, sir. I see. Now, you have told us in your evidence that you were wounded, and that despite your desire to remain on deck, the captain had you carried below uh, for your own safety. That's right, sir. He only thinks of others, sir. Uh, quite, 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 quite. Now, will you describe to us briefly the general position at the time you were taken below? Well, sir, we'd already crippled two French ships, and we were then engaging the other two, and giving them hell to... We could... Had you suffered much uh, damage and casualties? We were a wreck, sir. Mm -hmm. Mizzen topmast shot away, fore and mainmast down about our ears. The French three-decker was right alongside and pumping broadsides into us. We had so many wounded below that it sounded like bedlam. Half our gun crews were dead at their guns, and the deck was too slippery with blood to walk on, sir. I found out afterwards that, that we had 117 killed and 145 wounded. Oh, yes. Silence! Silence, please! Now, Captain Bush, I want you to think carefully before answering this question. Remember, it is possible that this very day you might be called upon in your capacity as a British naval captain to fight just such another battle in command. If you were called upon to fight such a battle, and if you found your ship and crew in the condition you have described, would you surrender to the enemy? Yes, sir. Knowing that you would be called upon to answer for your action? I'd still do it, sir. Would you consider that while your ship was yet afloat, it might still be recaptured and made serviceable to its country? Yes, sir. If you had no crews to fire the guns and few to repel borders, would you think it reprehensible to throw away the lives of the remainder when no victory could come of the gesture? I call it criminal, And sir. one more question, Captain. If you had disabled four enemy ships and inflicted upon them dreadful casualties, would you consider that proof of your skill and determination? I think it might point that way, sir. Thank you, Captain Bush. However faulty your judgment may be, I venture to suggest that it is a judgment with which most practical sailors would concur. <laughs> Bush sat down, beaming like a hurricane lamp. The prosecuting and defending officers grinned at each other across the court, and the next witness was called. I was weary of the whole thing. and was heartily relieved when the last witness had been heard, the last speeches made, and the court was adjourned. Back in my cabin, I, I found an elegant civilian dressed in buff and blue with a neat silk cravat. His face seemed vaguely familiar. Calendar introduced him. I'll come for you again when the court's reached its decision. In the meantime, may I present Mr. Hookham Fear of His Majesty's Government? When I heard his name, I remembered why his face seemed familiar. I'd seen it caricatured many times. He was the famous wit who wrote in the anti-Gallican and was deep in the secrets of the cabinet. He bowed elegantly, almost effeminately, and begged leave to ask me some questions. But truth to tell, I hardly paid any attention to him. Now that I was out of the court, I, I burned to be back there, to get it over and to hear the worst. It seemed an age before Calendar returned. What were your impressions of conditions in France, sir? Oh, that's a long story, sir. In the first place, sir, will you excuse me, Mr. Fair? Most certainly, sir. The court is assembled, Captain Hornblower. Thank you. I'll come immediately. Is the executioner present, or do they have to send to London for him? Oh, that's not fair, Hornblower. You know I'm not permitted to discuss this case with you. No, no, I'm sorry. It was unforgivable of me. I'm a little... <clears throat> well, not quite myself. Well, here we are. You won't have to wait much longer. My heart was beating hard as I went in. and I knew that I was pale. I jerked my head erect to meet the eyes of the judges in their blue and gold. But somehow all seemed lost in a vague mist. Only one thing was plain. The table in the small cleared space before the president where my sword lay. I saw nothing of the cabin, nothing of the judges. My eyes saw only my sword and the message it would give me. The hilt was toward me. The hilt. I was not guilty. Silence, please. 
Captain Hornblad, my lord. This court is of the unanimous opinion that your gallant and unprecedented defense of His Majesty's ship Sutherland against a force so superior is deserving of every praise the country and this court can give. Your uh, conduct, together with that of the officers and men under your command, reflects not only the highest honor on you, but on the country at large. You are therefore most honorably acquitted. Look at them, look at them, Hornblower. Every ship in the fleet is a yard's man with killing men. You're, you're famous. Congratulations, Captain Hornblower. Congratulations on behalf of His Majesty's government. Not that there was any doubt about it, of course. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fair. I, I should have been happy to have been able to share your confidence. And now, sir, if you're ready, I've had a post-chaise horse been waiting this last six hours. My orders are to convey you immediately to London. To London? But... Will you be good enough to step into the barge? Thank you, sir. I uh, suggest, sir, that you take off your hat to show the fleet how much you appreciate their good wishes. The hat on your arm, please. Uh, this way. Captain Horatio Hornblower, Mr. Hookham Briar. Ah, Hornblower, welcome home. Come and be presented. Your Royal Highness, this is Captain Hornblower. Evening, Captain. Everyone's been talking about you, Captain. Yes, and so they ought to, damn it, Captain. So they ought to. Damn smart bit of work. Good as I could have done myself. Here, Cunningham, make the presentation. Yes, sir. It was all a dream, surely. I felt the accolade and, and heard the formal words which dubbed me knight. Rise, sir, Horatio Hornblower. <laughs> a ribbon to be hung over my shoulder, a star to be pinned on my breast, and a red cloak to be draped about me, a vow to be repeated, signatures to be written. I was a knight of the most honorable order of the bath, as somebody loudly proclaimed, with a ribbon and a star to wear for the rest of my life. The congratulations flowed about me like a sea. My best wishes to you, Colonel. Colonel, sir. Uh, his Royal Highness has been pleased to appoint you one of his colonels of Marines. I was still dazed. A colonel of Marines received pay to the amount of twelve hundred pounds a year and did no duty for it. It was an appointment given to successful captains to be held until they reached flag rank. I remember that my prize money already amounted to six thousand pounds. I'd attained financial security at last, for the first time in my life. I had a title, a ribbon, and a star. Everything I'd ever dreamed of having, in fact. But what I wanted most was to go to Barbara and my son. <laughs> the poor man's days. Uh, sir, I, I am overwhelmed, sir. I hardly know how to thank your royal highness. Oh, thank me by joining us at Hazard. Your arrival interrupted a damn interesting game. Bring that bell, Sir John. Let's have some wine. No, no. Sit here beside Lady Jane, Captain. Yes, well, sir, it's very... Uh, uh, doesn't the Captain want to play? Oh, yes, well, yes, I know all about you, Wilkham. You want to slip away to John Walter. Well, tell him to write one of his damn leaders and get my civil list raised. I work hard enough for it, God knows. Well, I, I, I don't see why you want to take the Captain away. Oh, very well, then, damn you. Go if you want to. I didn't imagine you cared to say Hazard. I know I wouldn't. Not if the prince were using his own dice. Well, thanks for getting me out of it. Um, who is uh, John Walter that His Royal Highness referred to? He's the editor of the Times. Huh? There'll have to be a big story about you and your knighthood. The public's got to realize that the government's naval officers are achieving great things. Oh, so my knighthood is a political move, too. And all the other honors? Everything's political, my dear fellow. Huh. But you wouldn't have got it if you hadn't earned it. And now, I took the liberty of engaging a room for you at the Golden Cross. I had your baggage sent round, and they're expecting you. They were. Host and chambermaid and boots all fluttered and bowed and almost prostrated themselves. It was yes, Sir Horatio, and no, Sir Horatio, until I could have knocked their heads off. 
They made a procession of lighting me up to bed and then fussed round me interminably when all I wanted was a little peace. But I was left alone at last to plunge into bed and spend a sleepless night going over again all the details of that amazing day and wondering what the morrow held in store. Sir Horatio Hornblower. Horatio! Welcome home. Barbara was in black. Of course, Leighton had been dead for less than a year still. But black suited her. Her skin was creamy white against it. It was with a pang that I remembered the golden tan of her cheeks in the old days on the Lydia. The nurse is bringing Richard. Meanwhile, heartiest congratulations on your success. Thank you. Thank you. I, I've, I was extremely lucky, really. Oh, the lucky man is usually the man who knows how much to leave to chance. Ah, oh, thank you, nurse. You may leave little Richard with us. And this was my son. This little bundle with the brown eyes looking up at me. This tiny light thing with her held in my arms. I was no sentimentalist, yet there was something in my eyes that made it difficult for me to see clearly. I felt a warm rush of affection for the poor, helpless baby that I held. I looked up at Barbara, and it seemed to me that her eyes, too, were not quite dry. And... But she was smiling. You have so much now, Horatio. Wealth, position, a future, and a son. It's, it's only the latter that I really prize, Barbara. Yet, it, it is the wealth and the position that I would like to share. Oh, and not your son? Oh, you have almost made him yours. All I want in the world is in this room at this moment. All that I want, too, Horatio. Come to me, Barbara. My son shall not come between us. He shall be our son. Oh, Horatio. Horatio Hornblower, starring Michael Redgrave, is based on the novels by C.S. Forrester. Music composed and conducted by Sidney Torch. Produced by Harry Allen Towers.